I've been making YouTube videos for a long time now. When I was in my early teens, I, like many other people, liked doing simple gaming videos. Over time, I experimented with different channels and doing different niches until I eventually got to where I am now with this current YouTube project, which, I will add, is so far my favorite out of all of them. I don't mention this because I'm trying to imply that this advice is inherently good due to the length of my experience, I just want to get the point across that I've been doing YouTube as a hobby for a long time, and to me, my life would feel kinda empty if I wasn't doing it. Really, any decent hobby feels like that. It fills your time and gives your life purpose, and your life would probably feel kinda empty if you didn't have that hobby anymore. With that said, this comes from the perspective of the YouTube hobbyist, the kind of person who's more concerned with having a good time than trying to gain attention or create a career out of this sort of thing. And if I'm being honest, there's no point in making YouTube content anyways if you're not having fun in the first place. No amount of ad revenue and sponsorship money is going to motivate you to create content you don't like just to get that paycheck. When you start obsessing over profits and optimizing yourself for the algorithm, them, you lose sight of the fun. So, this is called anti-YouTube advice because pretty much any YouTube creator advice video will go over similar points, and I'm going to explain how most of that common and cliché advice can actually hurt a YouTube hobbyist's experience with the platform. Here's the ones I'll debunk, and there will also be timestamps in the description if you want to skip to a specific tip. Tip number one, share your video links around on social media. Most people already know that this is a bad idea because it leads a lot of creators to basically spam their links, and the more desperate ones will start sharing their links in online spaces where it doesn't really belong. But there's another consequence to this that I don't think many people are fully conscious of. Now, I've been coming up with a theory recently that I like to call internet microcultures, in which a creator's own personality or interests is the topic or subculture they're posting under, and not something more broad like a content category such as tutorials, gaming, or news. Sharing links around on social media breaks your ability to form a fun microculture because because most social media networks work around broad categories instead of those microcultures. For example, with my old Eccentric Rants channel, I used to share links around on leftist Discord servers and subreddits. This made it impossible to form a microculture for my channel because I now had audiences of people coming from the broad category of leftist subreddits and Discord servers, which meant that most of my new viewers expected me to create content under a broad leftist category instead of my own personal microculture. They go in with the expectation that I will make leftist content and not Calvin content that the theme is the category and not whatever I personally feel like making videos about. If you're going to be a hobbyist, a potential viewer or fan should enjoy your content for your personality and form the expectation that your content will be worth watching not because it follows a category, but because you're interesting enough, to them at least, that whatever you end up making that you find interesting, they will probably find interesting as well. Get what I mean? Because if you share your content on social media, you'll build an audience with expectations that contrast what you actually want to do, and you can't just get rid of them once they're subscribed. Yes, that's right, subscribers can be bad. Hot take, I know, but what I'm stressing here is that the type of audience you cultivate is incredibly more important than the size of it. So, if you talk about passions with your friends who like to listen, share your content with them first and let it spread organically from there. By organically, I mean slowly through word of mouth. Slow growth, in this case, is what you want. Tip number two, make videos about popular topics and current events. Now, to be fair, I'm not saying you're not allowed to do this or that you should avoid it like poison, but your channel shouldn't rely on it. Just like the advice in regards to sharing links, too many YouTubers rely on it as a way to grow their channel, which means that this strategy is not unique or special anymore. But as I said previously with tip number one, this will also make it hard to form a microculture. The difference here is that instead of your audience expecting you to ascribe to a certain community category, they will now come in with the expectation that all of your content will be exactly like the one video they watched because it covered a particular topic. Your audience in this case expects this one video to be a complete representation of you as a content creator instead of a sampler. To give you an example, because hey, I wouldn't know about this if I hadn't experienced it personally, I had a video on my old channel called Required Suffering, and it unexpectedly blew up when I posted it to a community where my videos usually never got a lot of attention. This became a problem not only because the surge of subscribers I got from it were mostly inactive not even months after they subscribed, but it's also because I was trying a new format of video that I called Rants, where I would talk unscripted instead of my usual scripted video essays. This meant that a large number of my viewers were given a bad sample of what the rest of my content would be like, making the experience worse for them as viewers and me as a content creator. I have a feeling that part of the reason it blew up was because I referenced a lot of hot topic current events to explain the points I made in that video, and that's most likely why all those new subscribers became inactive, because they thought I would militantly stick to expressing all of my thoughts through the guise of current events, which I don't care to do. Admittedly, it's also just too much of a chore to try and create content quickly enough about a current event or hot topic for it to still be relevant by the time I upload it. So even with the microculture and audience cultivation stuff aside, this process is annoying unless you genuinely like covering current events and want to be some kind of alternative news source flavor of content creator. Tip number three, strive for more internet good boy points. 
I'm sure I don't need to explain that by internet good boy points, I mostly mean metrics like views, comments, watch hours, that kind of thing. Your content should not be made unnecessarily long to fit watch time metrics, nor should you be finding ways to bully, I'm sorry, I mean entice people into feeding your interaction metrics. When I first started doing video essays, I assumed that a good video essay had to be really long, like the ones I enjoyed watching from YouTubers such as HBomberGuy and VelocityTube. What ended up happening is that the first few I ever made were full of fluff that didn't take me long to regret. Hell, what's ironic is that when I just allowed my videos to be as short as they needed, viewers saw that as a strength because such content was perceived as being concise and to the point. So really, instead of forcing yourself to fit some kind of algorithmically convenient mold, it's better to just let your videos turn into whatever they're supposed to, and your friends or followers will eventually point out the strengths in your specific way of making content. On the flip side, I find it annoying that audiences waste their comments on saying things like boost for the algorithm or this content deserves more views, because really, this is something that damn near everyone says, and while I'm not mad at my audience for sometimes doing this because I know the internet has cultivated them to act this way, I just find it to be a nuisance as I tend to prefer meaningful feedback or or none at all. Those comments don't mean much because once most of them are saying the same things, it begins to feel like watching the static of a broken television. There's no point giving it attention or reading it because I start habituating. I know it takes a lot of effort to actually point out something you like about a video or add something meaningful, but listen, if you can't do that, let me just save you the effort and let you know that you don't need to leave a comment. It's not my expectation. Please don't waste your time with it. If you want to lurk, by all means own it and enjoy it. I don't mind. Don't force yourself to interact with content because you think you need to boost an algorithm. Because really, I don't want my audience to come from an algorithm anyways. It's only going to put more people in my audience who probably aren't going to care about my channel as a whole. Tip number four, make content on a schedule. I know you've seen literally hundreds of YouTube channels who can post on a schedule, but you have to understand that normal, everyday people are usually not capable of doing that. A lot of these channels are corporations, creators of production teams, or projects that are a collaboration between multiple people. If you're an individual making content, you have to understand that good content takes time. Even if you are somehow able to make your videos on a schedule, the second you don't adhere to it, your audience is going to get upset because they were trained with that expectation. And additionally, it will kill your drive to keep making content since you'll feel like you're returning to a ghost town. A better alternative is to give content updates and to announce content a week or so ahead of time so people know when to expect it. You can make predictable, easy to expect content without having to churn it out consistently like a damn robot. Seriously, there was a time in my life with my old channel where I was unmotivated and more depressed than usual, and in order to keep up my pace of uploading once or twice a month, I ended up doing a lot of rants that were long-winded and incredibly low quality. At time of writing, I am still in the process of rewriting most of them as proper videos, and they're immensely better than what they were before because I actually took the time to put some work and passion into them. You really, really don't want to make quick content that you will regret later. It's a waste of time, and it's demoralizing. Tip number five, have a purpose or mission statement. Oh boy, a lot of small left tube channels suffer from this issue in droves. Back when my previous channel was kind of new, there were a lot of other small left tube channels that I knew at the time, and a lot of them would, maybe without consciously realizing it, pompously try to justify the existence of their content by saying it had the purpose of de-radicalizing people, or that their mission statement was to educate the public on leftism. But like, this is a hobby? You don't pick up knitting and then force yourself to justify it by saying that your goal is to help everyone keep warm this winter by using your skills to knit them stocking caps, yeah? So why force yourself to do that with YouTube? You don't need to justify literally any of the things you enjoy doing. If you want it to feel purposeful, go ahead. But the purpose can just be as simple as, I like making YouTube videos because they're my favorite way to express myself. I mean, that's literally the reason I make videos. I'm not going to try and put up this facade to make myself seem more important than I'm setting out to be. I'm just a person on the internet making videos for fun. I don't need to be the noble educator and de-radicalizer. Fuck that. In my hobby activities, I don't owe anybody anything. I remember the first time someone gave me that piece of advice. They'd tell me something along the lines of, Calvin, you don't know anyone shit. And at first, because of their wording, I didn't internalize that advice because I believed that following it would make me an asshole. And I don't want to be an asshole. However, with time, I realized that they worded it like that because they had way more experience than I did with people who expected way too much out of the parasocial relationships they were forming on the internet. They worded it so harshly, not out of a lack of generosity towards others, but out of tiredness from having experienced what it's like to believe that you do somehow owe people something for just existing and having hobbies. They don't know anyone's shit, and neither do you. Tip number six, adapt to your audience. To be fair, I do adapt to my audience. 
with accessibility features such as captions and content warnings, the only time you need to adapt to your audience is to make your content more accessible to people who might be sensitive to harsh topics or people who need accessibility features. But let's be real, when most people tell you to adapt to your audience, they mean sanitizing your content so a wider range of people can consume it, or rather, playing into the audience interests instead of your own. Don't let your most viewed types of content dictate everything you make in the future. Don't force yourself to be so boring and generic that your audience becomes so large that you can no longer have a personality. Really, when it comes to your content and your hobby, your audience adapts to you. If they don't like your content or who you are, they can leave and watch someone else. No hard feelings. There's no point in convincing people to stick around or watch your content if that means you're not allowed to be yourself anymore. Just as encourage engagement metrics is really just a euphemism for bully your viewers to interact with your content, adapt to your audience is really just a euphemism for make entertaining others your priority instead of your own enjoyment. Like with the you don't owe anyone shit piece of advice, I think I need to contextualize it so you can properly internalize it. Do you think humans would do anything for fun if they were forced to make it entertaining every time? Do you think anyone would ever sing in their car if they thought they were only allowed to do so if they sounded good, or paint only if they knew people were going to like what they put on the canvas? Hell no. Sing off-key, make weird paintings. Your hobby does not exist to be entertaining to anyone but yourself first. If someone else enjoys what you make or do, that's a bonus, not an expectation. Yeah, these are performative arts, but performance never needed to imply talent. You might perform at a talent show, but that doesn't mean every performance requires talent. Tip number seven, balance time investment and attention quantity. Oh look, it's another trap I fell for when I was new to making video essays. Back when I was first making them, I thought that the video essays that took more time to make were only worth it if they got more views. And on the other hand, I was convinced that I didn't need to care about shorter videos because they didn't take a lot of time and they didn't need many views to justify them. Like a lot of these other tips, it's just another harmful way of thinking that's going to put a heavy ball and chain on your creative process. It's just another form of forcing you to be convenient for consumption and play into expectations. Really, my advice here is as simple as this. Don't let attention dictate what you feel is worth taking more time to make. If the process was fun, then it doesn't matter if it was long. Your hobby isn't a portfolio. You're not investing time to get returns in the form of views and likes. Again, this is a hobby. You're doing this for fun. Tip number eight, don't be quick to ban people. I saved the most controversial for last, and I'll make this last one quick. Fuck anyone who tells you that you should be afraid of banning people from your communities or your comment sections. It's the strategy of bad faith people and assholes on the internet to convince you that if you don't listen to their drivel that you're somehow a fragile snowflake who can't take criticism. Obviously, the hard part here is learning what actual criticism is and what's just a person disguising their shitty behavior as criticism, but the easy part is clicking the ban button when you realize that they're the latter and not the former. But just to reiterate, you do need to listen to valid criticism, and it's important that you learn what real criticism looks like. So yes, if you have a lot of toxic people giving you a hard time or shitting up your community, ban them. It might not teach them to change their behavior, hell, it might even piss them off, but the ban button isn't a tool to regulate their behavior. It's a tool to save you the frustration of giving them attention. Anyways, with all that said, I can personally guarantee you absolutely nothing if you follow this advice. If I'm being truthful here, I've duped you. I've framed gallivanting about the things I've learned over the course of being a content creator as advice because it gives me an excuse to shamelessly mention it all over the course of an entire YouTube video. But hey, maybe I'll end up being accidentally right and save someone some time and frustration. And that thought alone makes me a little happier.